Emily. Good afternoon. I'm Katie Benoit, Chief Division of Transportation Planning at Caltrans Headquarters here in Sacramento. Thank you all for being here in the room and for those of you listening online. We look forward to a great afternoon discussion here on the role of big data in transportation planning. I welcome you all to this speaker series entitled Planning for the 21st Century Emerging Trends. We are inviting thought leaders from universities and industry to talk about the latest challenges and developments and trends in the field of transportation planning. We are looking to learn here at Caltrans on how to position ourselves for a more sustainable, multimodal, and integrated transportation system. This is the third of our four sessions. And as I said, we'll be talking about the role of big data in transportation planning. We have a great panel of experts today from universities in California and the private sector. Let me take a moment to welcome all our speakers will be moderated by Juan Argote. He is the Assistant Director of UC Connect at UC Berkeley. Juan's research focuses on public transportation operations and connected vehicle technology. He is also the co-founder of VIA Analytics, where he helps develop control tools for transit agencies to operate more efficiently. I'm going to let Juan introduce our speakers after I'm done here. In today's presentation, we hope to learn about research findings that showcase the role of big data in transportation planning and how we can use these tools. Each presenter is going to focus on a specific application using different data sources. We will learn how cellular data can help public agencies develop high resolution activity-based transportation demand models and how we can use data from social media to discover important urban trends. We will also learn about the recent initiatives involving traffic probe data, transit data, and traffic projection that expand the, date, the state of practice in big data analysis. These sessions are being webcast for the convenience of viewers the re video recording will be archived. We'll have all four of our sessions um, uh, available for those to review them later. And um, we have usually about an audience of at least 100 people also listening um, out there um, on the webcast. So before I close, let me convey my thanks to UC Connect um, at UC Berkeley who put this session together for working with our Caltrans staff here in Division of Transportation Planning and Research and Innovation. And let me hand over the microphone to Juan so he can do a complete introduction of our presenters. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katie, for your kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Juan Argote, and I'm the Assistant Director of UC Connect, the Region 9 University Transportation Center. And I am thrilled to be here to discuss the role of big data in transportation planning, a very relevant topic. Today, we live in a world where it is possible to generate, communicate, and store enormous amounts of data. This is made possible mainly by three factors. First. Uh, connectivity access is everywhere. We can now, uh, for example, access the internet on our phones independently of our location. Second, uh, the storage costs of information have been continuously going down for the last two decades. And third, we now use on a daily basis uh, several devices that are equipped with advanced sensing capabilities such as GPS, Bluetooth, accelerometers, and so on. So uh, never before has so much timely information about events people and objects, being so widely and quickly available. The growth in the amount of available information has triggered vast disruptions across diverse fields, being the transportation sector one of them. Uh, in, in, there are various areas within transportation that have been affected. For example, in intelligent transportation systems, uh, big data can be used to develop and improve freight distribution algorithms or mobility solutions. In the case of uh, transportation safety, 
we have that advanced vehicle sensing and communications can limit and minimize the, the number of uh, potentially risky uh, interactions between vehicles. And in the area of transportation planning, which is the focus of our panel today, we have that big data analytics can help us improve our understanding of uh, transportation and activity patterns, which in turn can, in can influence and improve the way in which we plan our transportation systems. So the data, the data to do so, uh, we, we all know that it's already out there, but the key lies in how to, how to use them effectively. And to that end, we have gathered today an outstanding panel of speakers, each of whom will tell us how we can effectively leverage this big data in the context of transportation planning. Our first speaker will be Scott Purley. Uh, Scott is Vice President of Performance Analytics at ITERIS. His group provides consulting services and develops, deploys, and maintains software tools supporting big data for public sector transportation agencies. Our second speaker will be Alexei Posnukov. Alexei is an assistant professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at UC Berkeley where he is also leading the Smart Cities Research Center. His research focuses in the area of complex data analysis in the domain of smart cities, including applications of streaming data analytics in urban mobility and location-based social networks. And finally, our third speaker, who's on his way right now, he's on a plane, but he'll be here later, uh, is Christoph Janowitz. He's, a, he's an associate professor for geographic information science and geoinformatics at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and he's the program chair of UC, UCSB's uh, Cognitive Science Program, one of, also one of two editors-in-chief of the Semantic Web Journal and a faculty research affiliate of the Center for Information, Technology, and Society. And with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Scott, our first speaker. So, Scott. Thank you. Let me get you, let me get you set up. Thanks. Uh, Thank you, Juan. Thank you, Katie. Uh, and thank you to, uh, to Caltrans for, and to uh, UC Connect for inviting us here today. Uh, as Juan mentioned, I'm the Vice President of Performance Analytics for ITERIS. We run the, uh, the PEM system for, for Caltrans. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is the um, yeah, relatively mature version of a big data uh, source that is being integrated uh, nationally and that we're in the process of pulling into the Caltrans instance of PEMS um, for traffic probe data. And I'll talk a little bit about the different types of flavors of, of, of probe data, what its um, aspects are, um, uh, look at some of the unmodeled uh, versions of probe data and talk about um, sort of its strengths and weaknesses and, and, uh, and, and, talk, and talk through those uh, pieces of the puzzle. So uh, first I'll kind of give an overview of, 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 of PEMS or IPEMS. So ITIR is stuck an eye in front of it for the folks who are used to it from Caltrans. Um, and then um, uh, I'll go through the, the big data itself, the types of big data that there are. We, this, I'm focusing particularly on probe data sets here, but we also uh, work with other types of big data um, uh, in, in other cases, but we'll, we'll focus on the probe data for this purposes, this uh, presentation. Um, and then sort of how do you apply big data? What do you do with it? How does it, how does it actually f sort of function within a tool? How does it relate to the data that sets that you already uh, collect and process? Talk a little bit about the freight opportunity. So the, there's a data sets provided by the Federal Highway administration uh, specific data set that I'll go through today called the National Performance Research Data Set that, that has freight uh, probe data in it that, that agencies across the country are using and we've, we've worked with it a bit to, to, uh, to see freight trend patterns that are, that are interesting that you can do with big, in a, with big data that you have a harder time doing otherwise. And then uh, how do you leverage these software tools themselves uh, to, to, uh, for big data and in comparison to the types of data that you have otherwise. So a little bit about ITERIS itself. Um, so we're a leader in the ITS space, uh, and particularly in the software um, information solutions process. We have three groups within the company itself. Um, our group is the green box on the bottom, the analytics piece where we have um, consultants who help agencies with analytics projects, and I'll go through a couple of those so for examples of some multimodal work that we've done. And then the software orientation where we start to fold in all data of all, of all sorts of different types, like through PEMS, uh, to, prov to provide agencies with tools that they can then use to, to understand the state of their uh, multimodal uh, transportation network. So ITERIS PEMS provides a set of powerful tools and analytics to let, to let agencies essentially understand and measure system performance. 
Uh, it supports many different data types, and it, um, PEMS itself grew up as a, as a fixed point detector based uh, product. Um, that managed uh, loops or radar um, uh, and fixed point detectors and then processed them and smoothed them out over space. Um, then we've we, uh, merged into the link-based solutions, so Bluetooth data, uh, re-identification type of technologies, toll tags, um, and then we layer onto that the sort of the cause components of accidents and incidents and official crash records, TASIS type, type, type data, and then getting into multimodalism um, for, and, and deeper into the, into the network of our arterials, for example, for signal timing, um, transit data, and so, and so forth. Uh, we run different types of systems, so we run um, Caltrans systems run, run on premise. Uh, most of our deployments are actually cloud hosted, and so we run them in, in, in Amazon and uh, on EC2 instances. Um, and so that just depends on the, on the client, but when we're now processing these really large data sets, um, they, there are certain challenges related to that that are different than, than you traditionally run into when you're trying to run a software application like this. Um, so to summarize, and I'm sure many of you are very familiar with this, but in case there were folks um, either uh, in the audience uh, here or outside that weren't familiar, so PEMS essentially is a real-time transportation data warehouse. All the data that we pull in comes in in real time, and we aggregate and normalize that to a, to a common schema. It's always online, it's always available, and we make lots of planning and operations types of reports on top of that, where we roll the data up over space and time um, and store those results in queries that you can then uh, sort of calculate in real time and then use over, over uh, lo the long term for long term historical trends or for uh, uh, current condition comparisons. Um, and then we provide those variety of displays to different types of users, and so there's, there are different sections of folks who, are, who use data from tools like these, uh, including f uh, folks who are, who are trying to work on the operations of the system, the, who manage the, uh, the, the planning functions of an agency, or who are responsible for the maintenance of the I infrastructure that's uh, put into the, to the tools themselves, uh, or to, to the public who is interested in le learning what the summary data looks like. So thinking about the types of technologies that you can use, and so that ranges from, uh, you know, if you look at sort of here at the, at the bottom set, the you know, sort of classic example would be the infrastructure detectors, and that's where a lot of systems started out. But then that sort of jumps to this hybrid type of model where you're getting these re-identification technologies, whether it's a Bluetooth reader or, uh, or a license plate reader or, or um, um, uh, those sorts of things. Or, and then you sort of evolve into this mobile detector world. And so mobile detectors can be in cars like I've shown here, or they could be on pedestrians, or they could be in bikes. And so there are some interesting data sets like Strava that look at activities for bicyclists. And they, um, Florida just acquired a, data set, a Strava data set to then share with, share with folks. And so we played with some of those to do sort of activity-based things that isn't really folded into software yet, but could be. Um, and in a sort of a multimodal world. This molded, mobile detector piece of it though, um, currently what's the, the predominant um, uh, source is a GPS reading for, for, for a location and I'll show you kind of an example of that. Um, but they are, there are many, many different types of sensors on the cars now and so there's, they're starting to get into um, deeper, richer data sets um, that are less mature but being, being uh, played with and analyzed by some of the auto manufacturers and the OEMs and the, and the, and the people who are aggregating the GPS appropriate data themselves. So uh, big data has sort of an amorphous uh, definition. In the, for the purposes here, I'm, I'm going to focus on the traffic pro data. And so it's uh, you know, a trace of data from a vehicle or a aggregated up to a collection of vehicles where you get a location, a speed, and a heading from each of these different data points that comes from the device that's in the car or the car, or the car itself. That then sort of gets grouped by many, many different um, individual um, devices and, and readings. You then have to s um, al align that location of the, of the, the probe to, to a roadway, and then it gets segment segmented into some form or fashion. The traditional version of segmentation um, is, is called a, a traffic message channel, uh, which is an industry standard that was used to send data to in-vehicle navigation systems. Um, there are now different versions of segmentation that, um, that some of the traffic pro providers are providing that um, seg segment that further, either by using offsets from TMCs uh, for, for a particular distance, or they make their own network of segmentation, and there's a lot of challenge in trying to match up those segmentations to each other to then apply within a, within a tool 
um, or to match it up to an agency's particular um, linear referencing system to then match their segmentation of, uh, of the traffic probe data to the, um, to the agency's uh, source itself. Um, and so these, this segmentation uh, that gets processed for a particular time, um, you get these speeds, you, you understand the distance and the length of the roadway, and then you apply that within the, the, the software tools. And so how does big data help um, an agency? So compared to traditional methods, um, you would take a fixed point detector at a location and then you would apply that over some version of space and say that the, point, that the data that comes from this particular spot represents the data that's across all of these spots. Um, that's not the be all, quite the best way to do it, but was sort of the best way that, that you would had before the, the, the traffic probe uh, uh, data came around. Now you, over the, over the last several years, you know, we're now getting sort of early, in about 2008, 2008, we started to get a little bit of probe data. It was very sparse. The data didn't really work out all that well. There was some challenges with it, but over the years, the sort of proliferation of, of, of GPS devices has now sort of exploded that, that, that space. And now you're getting more vehicles at more times over more distance, and so now you've got this large area of coverage where you're getting data a lot of the time on many of the roadways. It's not universally um, um, deep uh, in terms of, you know, traffic freeways have lots of data a lot of the time because there's just simply more, more vehicles on it versus the arterial roadways. And so you then start to get into the questions of well, how, is this, how is this data model? There's modeling that's done by the private sector providers, or you can get unmodeled data, which is what Federal Highway selected to do. Um, in the National Performance Research Data Set, uh, but, it, but it essentially helps you in, in, in other ways. Um, you know, traditional travel time runs are expensive to do. The probe data itself is cheaper. You can get it over a wider area, and you get sort of deeper insights of what's the reliability look like over a longer period of time and um, larger coverage um, and deeper days. So, you know, what does the mountain uh, travel look like on a Saturday up to, to, to Big Bear or, um, you know, those sorts of types of patterns that are, are complicated to get otherwise through more tra traditional means. Um, so there's a handful of sort of commercial speed data providers, and so uh, co a company called Here, which used to be Navtech Nokia, um, uh, provides data in District 8, and so we're in the process of folding that data into uh, the Caltrans instance of PEMS. Um, INRIX has uh, provided data to the Metropolitan Transportation Commission in the Bay Area, and so they've used that data for, for a number of years. Um, then there's the National Performance Research Data Set, which is sort of the third uh, bucket, and so sometimes people get confused between the two different versions because here is the source of, of both of those data sets. That in this case, um, in the National Performance Research Data Set, um, this is a data set that's free to states and MPOs. Um, it's traffic probe data aggregated to five-minute um, buckets over the national highway system only, um, and it's freight and auto travel times. And so the freight data is provided by ATRI, which puts um, Qualcomm. Um, uh, readers onto, onto, tr onto trucks that have a certain uh, classification. And then that data, those two data sets are provided together as monthly data files that you can then take and, and, and process. The complications with that t t type of data set is when there's no probe data, you get a blank spot for that five minute period for whatever, for whatever TMC reference code there is. You have to decide what, what to do with it. And they don't do any outlier processing. And so there's, it's sort of the, any warts that are sort of present in the data remain present in the data and you're sort of required to do that. And that works pretty well for, for states like Rhode Island who can sort of take their small data set over their small network and put that into um, a, a small database and sort of use that. It's much more complicated for states like California that <laughs> have a much, much larger network um, and need to do a lot of process processing against that. And so. Um, we are sort of worked with both sets of data, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit sort of how the National Performance Research data sets works in, in terms of um, explaining how, how that works otherwise. TomTom Tom is a third, is a sort of a, another provider. They also provide sort of the same, same data sets, but each of them has their sort of own rules as to how they process the data. And when, when agencies use the traffic pro data, they all often want to understand, well, how did you come up with this number? What is it? Is it really real time? Is it not quite real time? And so what we, we do in the software world is we expose all that as much as we get from the providers themselves. And so they use these um, intervals that they call 
uh, confidence rankings that allow you to understand if the data was processed from probe data or wasn't processed from probe data or how much of it was. Um, and so we use that alongside the data um, uh, to, to show as well. So I want to dig a little bit deeper into the National Performance Research data set to talk about that as a sort of a foundational support of um, uh, allowing you to understand how this sort of big data sets work, uh, what, the, what sort of it looks like when before, if um, you can purchase the data from the provider where they pre-process it for you, or you can acquire these, this type of data set that Federal Highway provided that doesn't have this sort of pre-processing to it. And so this is a map of the national spatial coverage for the National Performance Research data set. Um, it looks like this in the data files, and so there's a, um, a code, a TMC code that I referenced, and these uh, numbers have uh, related to, a, this is a, a country, the first number is the country, then there's a, a table uh, ID, and then there, these N's and P's stand for different directions of the roadway that don't mean north or south or east or west. Uh, but they mean, um, a, 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 so you have to have the map to sort of understand it. And then they have some, some codes at the end of it. They assign a date to it. There are, uh, f they're each a five minute period, so they're uh, 288 epochs in a day, um, one, each number representing a five minute from, from midnight. Uh, there's a travel time data for all of the vehicles, a travel time data for auto, and a travel time for freight. Um, and so each of these um, are these different periods for, for midnight, and what that data looks like when you start to process it, um, and so the, the, the colorings that you see here and the lines represent the speeds over the course of the day, and so the, uh, for, the different, for different types of roadways. And so this is for the, for the interstate, that's fairly good coverage. The grays represent, uh, the lines are at the midpoints of the TMC, so you can see the spacing of their segmentation. So the gray, the gray represents sort of the, the how wide or small some of them are. They all connect to with each other. Um, and so there's no actual spacing in here, but I wanted to show that sort of the relationship of the, over the, over the course of the network, the way they segment the data up to, is, is different. Um, and then in some cases, like the highway example here, there's sort of lar one large TMC that's here and then some smaller ones that are, exist in this section. Uh, and then you can see over the course of time, there's you know, less probe data overnight um, there's more probe data in the middle of the day, and then it sort of fades out at night, and so that gets a little choppier here on the arterial case, and it gets um, it gets uh, it's more um, sort of uniform in the interstate case. So even at night, there's a fair amount of pro pro traffic probe data uh, there. Um, in the model data sets, you don't see this variation, so you get the you get data all the time, but you get the confidence numbers to tell you whether that data is sort of more real or not. But the NPMRDS data lets you do some, some more of this sort of from, a, from a kind of a deeper understanding point. And so what that looks like for any sort of random TMC, and so this is a, these are the five minute probe points over the course of the day um, and their speeds. And what we do in the um, four states who, are, who don't want to purchase private sector data or would like to just work with the NPMRDS data as its sort of raw form and then process it, is that we apply um, algorithms like what we do in traditional PEMS for the traffic detector data. And so we have a, sort of a series of algorithms that we apply against it and we use um, the, the local data that's nearby or the um, or sort of more global uh, measures to apply the data to fill in the gaps when there's, for a particular TMC, there isn't any, any traffic data for that, for that particular spot. And then when you apply that to sort of a bunch of different TMCs, they all have slightly different patterns and it depends on where you are and what data was collected at that point and where, is this, is this a couple of years ago or is it more current? And so the more current ones have more observed data than the, than the, than the more, um, than, the, than those in the in past years. And they've been providing this data set since 2011, and um, so you can start, kind of see different patterns and the amount of data that has increased, increased over time. Uh, but we came up with methods to sort of be able to fill and process that data in, in a way. And so now that you have a data set like the National Performance Research data set, or you've acquired the data for private data from one of the private sources, sort of what, what do you do with it? What, how do you how do you then sort of fold it into a software application to use it, or what do you do with, you can't sort of take these data sets and stick them in Access um, and, or an Excel sheet and, and play with them on your desk. It, it requires some sort of larger sort of data set, and so the keys are kind of developing the, the key, key performance indicators and then using analytics to, to sort of process that data up into a form that you can do something with. And so there's a couple different stories that you could tell, and so uh, Caltrans has done um, a lot of interesting work over the years in doing sort of reliability stories with their, t their traffic detector days, and so many of these stories are, are similar 
to uh, to what um, uh, to what's been done with other types of data, but you can do it for more periods of time, for more coverage. And so the, really the biggest advantage of big data is that you get this much larger uh, um, sort, of, sort of data sets. And so you then have, instead of a kind of a standard one-time travel run, you've got this probability uh, density curve of travel times where you can figure out you know, for a particular percentile um, what's the travel time for, for, uh, for the percentile of, of data that you're looking to, to capture. Um, you can also go into different sorts of measures, and so a lot of the measures that are used for, uh, for traffic probe data are the planning time and buffer time uh, index, and so there's a speed-based measure. It doesn't have uh, traffic volume data attached to it, although you could, you could do that and start to produce delay measures. Um, and so you can get, you know, what's the you know, 95th percentile um, um, travel time for the planning time index, um, or you can do uh, the buffer time the, the, or the spread between the mean, uh, mean uh, travel time and the planning time, uh, so that you can get, so the, what, what's the variation in trip, um, in trip travel for the, uh, for, for, for the users. Um, and you can also look at the congestion and delay story, and so this is, you know, for a, for a roadway looking at sort of a classic queue and a bottleneck. Um, where those bottlenecks occur, and then the delay that's that's produced within the cause of the bottleneck to the back of the queue, um, you can sort of use that and then apply that over a much sort of lar larger area to get your to get your story. Um, some of the kind of big data customer successes that we have with with different agencies, and so we've worked with SFCTA um, on transit analysis using traffic probe data versus AVL ABC data to see what's the uh, level of service for each of those um, each of those different different data sources compared to each other. Uh, as a consulting practice, and then for the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, looking at bottlenecks from using the probe data to help find the bottlenecks themselves, and using the volume data from from PEMS to then sort of merge the two together, and then apply the vehicle hours of delay um, to those to those bottlenecks themselves. Another interesting case that we used was uh, taking the National Performance Research data set since it has the freight data in it, and looking at um, what, how, to, how does the comparison of, the, of uh, different uh, planning time index compared to passenger cars and, fr and freight look. And so this takes a look at um, the truck and passenger uh, car data. And so we found that, um, um, that freight trucks have more traffic than passenger cars in rural states, for example. And so you can use even the national data sets to kind of compare yourselves to others. Which is, which is sort of interesting. Um, and then um, in here, that, that freight trucks have a higher uh, PTI than passenger cars in general. Um, so their planning time index is worse. Um, and that's actually particularly true in, in uh, North Carolina and California. So sort of interestingly, you know, using a, a uniform data set that's across the country, you've got a different characteristic here in, in, uh, in, in North Carolina for some reason and California than you do in some of the other states. Um, and so you, you can sort of get these um, uh, interesting patterns out of this type of data that you couldn't, that would be very hard to derive otherwise. Um, and so uh, even, even taking a data set that you might not use, the National Performance Research data set, say, for example, because uh, you would like somebody else to model it for you um, and you didn't want to do it yourself, you could still use it for these sorts of functions that let you sort of analyze it. And you can take this and what we do with this particular data set, which I'm going to show in, in a little bit, is we pulled the National Performance Research data set into a tool that lets us tag by by area, and so we can then compare county to county or state to state, um, uh, and do uh, and and we use uh, Hadoop and MapReduce uh, to to process the data and tag it, and then um, feed the, feed information out from that um, in a in a very different way than we do in some of the other applications uh, to be able to do this sort of very very large processing. Um, uh, for data. For a more traditional case, um, so we're in the process of enabling these sorts of features within Caltrans. And so um, uh, Caltrans, through some work with uh, District 8, has acquired uh, here, here real time data. We're pulling, we pulled this, we also pulled in the real time data for Sandbag um, in a cloud instance. Now we're pulling it into Caltrans into the hosted instance. 
Um, for Sandbag, they wanted to automate their congestion monitoring, uh, their, C their CMP uh, reports. And so we made routes for all their CMP networks and then they can then go in and look at all of those particular routes um, and then look at the level of service for those routes for, for, for whatever days they would like to, to, to examine. And what we do is we pull that in. You can see in this map that you're getting uh, sort of freeway and arterial data because this is ubiquitously covered. Um, you get um, interactive uh, map functions where you can click on the links and see the speeds for the links, or you can make your own routes wherever you want to go. So you can put them on freeways or freeways arterials, and you can sort of drag the, um, the maps around. When you select uh, an individual link, you get the you know, speeds over the link. You can put the uh, patterns behind it, behind it uh, for a monthly pattern or for a typical average. You can see how those sort of relate. Then we put, we put uh, values up here at the top. It's a little hard to read on my version here. But there's the TMC code, what the free flow speed is for this particular link. Uh, what the speed limit is, what the confidence score is, and so this is telling you, you know, for this particular, they, in here's case, they range from 0.5 to 1, where 0.5 is speed limit, 0.7 is historical, and then 1 is all real time, um, and so there's usually some sort of sort of range f for that for that particular section. We then produce maps that do things for the for the operations folks, like uh, traffic anomalies, and so the where are things worse currently than they typically than they typically are, and so you could do sort of do that from longer term from longer term trends, um, and then you can make routes like this, and so this is the route the route enabling feature that we're pulling into into PEMS, where you can you can it's like what you can do on, on Google Maps, where you sort of stick the pins on the road, you make your routes, you save them, you can then drag your line to save another route for the same place, and so it's it's kind of in it moving the the state of being able to look at data anywhere for any route for any time to a to a, more, a much more dynamic uh, practice, and then you sort of cr create the create the route and save it, and um, and then uh, you can sort of go back and edit it and. And, and see it, and so it really gives you kind of a nice power to to, to really see data in a way that, that in, in the past was was much much harder to do. So if you did have a um, you know a, a, a you know larger condition or an unusual event, or you wanted to look at what that what that looked like, and you hadn't made your route before, you could sort of go in and, and see what that looks like um, in a in a dynamic way because you're getting data all the time everywhere. Um, so once those routes are created, then you get these um, sort of here's your, your pattern to the, to the route, here's your, uh, in this case, this is the average travel time, or we have travel time index and buffer time index, and um, we provide those uh, sorts of tools as well. Uh, and then you can do variability for like time of day measures, and so these are uh, the, the min mean max for, for, this, for this particular route that I selected. Um, uh, for whatever days of the week that you that you that you'd like to have, and so they're all many of them are speed-based measures, and so what, if you want to fold in uh, traffic volume data, you could you can do that and to, to produce the delay. Um, but we we try to give a sort of a, a nice range of of measurements, uh, and then we can do things like what you do with uh, traditional detectors. Only this is for all the probe data across this roadway. All the month. This is a month of data, and so each of these days are, are individual days of the month, and so. Um, this happens to be a September, and so this is Labor Day, um, and this is the Monday after, or the Tuesday after Labor Day, and so you can see um, what these boxes represent are the full course of the day, so from midnight to midnight, and from the beginning of the route to the end of the route, uh, and then you can see these bottleneck locations that show up, and you can see the uh, the patterns that happen on that you know, are more significant on the Thursdays and Fridays. Um, and you, um, as well as these interesting patterns that happen on the weekends. And so what I like about these charts um, is this happens to be uh, in Philadelphia where I'm from and so there's the, the zoo is here <laughs> um, and everybody goes to the zoo on the weekends. <laughs> And so you get these backups at this particular exit that you wouldn't expect. And so you, these, all these sort of patterns are sort of common and, and normal, but you're now seeing data over a much sort of longer period of time all the time, and you're getting a rich set of data in, in a time period that you, that you might not get otherwise. And so it, this kind of illustrates to me the kind of the benefits of this, of this, of having big data for this source. 
This is an example of the automation of the CMP that we did for the for for Sandbag. Uh, so these are all the uh, individual group, groups of uh, routes that they had for their CMP where they did this very manually before, and so now this automates it in a way that lets them sort of do this all the, do this all the time and be able to see for their different classifications of road type what their level of services is and be able to to analyze that speed and travel time and travel time index for for each of those. Taking a step sort of further uh, so, and kind of applying it to planning. So that's, there, there seem to be sort of two different groups of folks. Uh, there's the, there are folks within, the, within planning, and I'm a planner myself, that, that like to sort of dig in and analyze and, di and dig into the specific individual routes or an individual location and look at that. There are also folks who like to say, well, what's my big aggregate number? And that, what's these, tell, tell me what, this, what the data looks like for a region or a summary. And so there are ways to do this within sort of kind of interactive dashboards. And um, we've done some that like this, where we, this is sort of a real time oriented dashboard, uh, where we look at um, you know, freeway congestion for a particular uh, time period, how does it compare to normal where this you know, black band, and we tested a bunch of different types of these, but this is being able to use this traffic probe data in a way to get um, you know, for this for this measurement area, and so we're tagging all of these links and saying for the for the Bay Area for District Four, what's this? What's the measurement look like? And then all of these, um, it's giving us the top bottlenecks, and these circles represent all the incidents. And we, at one point, we're pulling in the ways data, so another big data data type set, um, and and as well as the CHP data. And then we then calculate these different aggregate statistics, and you can do interesting. Um, or you could do for, for this, this is with on top of the national performance research data set, and so, so instead of having all those individual numbers and statistics, you then sort of put it into a, uh, a, co a combined set where you've got congestion percentage, travel time index, planning time index. You can switch back and forth between the different types of um, freight or passenger vehicles. You can animate this over time. It gives you the aggregate statistics for your month that shows you the patterns uh, for the blue for the statistics. And we tried to use different um, coloring to represent, you know, when it's blue, it's congested percentage. When it's, when it's orange, it's planning time index. And give you kind of very visual cues for somebody who's trying to, to tell a story uh, with the data. Uh, and these are sort of some other screens since I'm running a little bit short on time. I'll zip through them fast, but these are sort of time of day and more dynamic type of plots where you can sort of use this data over sort of longer periods of time and see patterns that, uh, that, that evolve from it. Um, and then last, I think I wanted to go, cut, touch briefly on delay. And so um, the sort of the Valhalla of, of interest is to try to get delay on top of the traffic probe data. And so what, we did, what we've done is taken the HPMS data, split it apart, process that to then attach to all of the tra uh, traffic probe data to get universal uh, delay that we can apply over these geographic areas. You could also use you know, traditional methods to apply to attach that data to it as well. Uh, but there you can sort of go at different levels of, of sophistication uh, uh, for this. And there are some, some of the traffic probe providers are trying to extract probe data, tra extract volume data from their probe vehicles themselves to estimate. Uh, so there's some interesting work that's being done there that could eventually be folded into tools like this. So for, in summary, uh, you know, new data, big data sets uh, provide new opportunities for broader coverage, more times a day with new types of data. This is really traffic probe data is relatively mature now. Um, there, are, there are other sources that are going to be talked about uh, sort of later today and emerging data from the connected vehicle type market that will get another, other, other data sets that you can just essentially layer on top of, of these types to get to, 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 to tell uh, more deep stories. Um, and then to aggregate them to understandable summaries like I showed in the, in the dashboards uh, as well as detailed reports like, like uh, we're able to do with the, the congestion management reports. And I think with that, I'll turn it over. Thank you. <laughs> well, questions at the end? Questions will okay. Here, right, mm -hmm. and then this a little pointer if you want. Good. Right. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Alexei Poznakov. I'm a 
professor in the systems and transportation at UC Berkeley. And uh, I am a computer scientist. I'm actually a mathematical physicist to start with, but then I turned into computer science and I was doing pattern recognition. And I was doing pattern recognition for video. You know, detecting faces, recognizing text from imagery. And, uh, and at some point in this work, we just realized there's so much data in cities that you could look at cities and apply these pattern recognition techniques to the things you see through these different modalities, you know? You could extract patterns from behaviors of people. And, you know, people do wonderful things. <laughs> it, it's, it's amazing, it's amazing, you know? And uh, do we really need to engineer something for cities? And all, all these questions, you know, they're so exciting. Uh, it's absolutely real. It's absolutely real. Most of the world lives like this. And you know, talk about the pedestrian safety. It's <laughs> 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 <They're> safe. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so we called engineers. Engineers build that, right? And we all know what happened. Uh, now the question is, what went wrong? Why our interference to transportation system went as it went? And I think nothing went wrong, right? And, and we are perfectly able to forecast what's going to happen and explain why it didn't happen and, and go on working on, on, on improving the transportation systems. But I think the effort needs to, to go quite uh, a bit into the demand forecasting. I think demand forecasting now becomes the bottleneck of many things that, that we, we really need to, to work on. And it's simply because the world of transportation is changing much, much faster. And it's not just the transportation that the options, it's also how people, how people behave and how people use these new options. And you know, uh, big data actually empowers us to, to, to do this transition. And do demand forecasting is in, in a principally new level. Because you know much more, you know, data, so you got data about the individual travelers, not the infrastructures. It's so much easier now to connect the dots of where people are, where they're going, and why. Uh, you observe them very, very uh, consistently through time. That's, that's also very important. And uh, the data like this was very expensive to collect traditionally through the surveys. And the question is, can we now substitute surveys with big data? My answer to this is not really. We'll, we'll have to, you know, to complement surveying. However, there's a lot of things that we can do. And I will guide you through several examples of our research projects where we look at various data sources and we try to improve travel demand models, first of all. However, you could clearly see some examples where the same technologies and the same methods could be applied in operations too. You could clearly see these analogies. Uh, anyway, so why I'm saying demand forecasting is becoming even more important than it ever was. It's simply that this pace of change in transportation is, is very fast now. And if you see a traditional cycle of how demand forecasting, how the planning went, uh, went on for cities, well, we were okay to wait for five to 10 years to actually collect the data through surveying, process it, uh, do all the required work to transform it into the demand models, apply it to cities through modifying the policies. And it was okay that we had five to 10 years delay. And it's still maybe okay now. However, if you look at this, these folks here, you know, who introduce the services without asking, Right, and they try to be disruptive, and they like to be disruptive. Is it okay to wait for five years to understand how they impact the system? I, I don't think so. And, and, and this current, current practice of trying to kind of fight or, you know, or support them, or maybe fight back within like six to 12 months delay, changing our policies, it's an okay time frame. But what if we could reduce that? And what if we could establish this, this dialogue between this private sector and transportation and the, the public sector like in a more streamlined way? Are there chances to do that? There are clearly advantages, right? Because they collect data not with this kind of latencies. Their latencies is milliseconds. And uh, it's not only the companies in the private sector who actually work on transportation who got the data. There's a huge ecosystem. 
There is a lot of companies in IT who know exactly the same about people's mobility patterns as companies who actually try to collect it. And they just don't use it. Let's say, you know, companies from social media and, and, and you know, all the Facebooks and Googles, they just collect that. Moreover, um, every single app now, almost every single app that you try to install on your phone, just in case, ask you a permission to collect your location data. They don't know why and how they will use it, but just in case they want to know where you are. <laughs> and, and we, kind of, as a society, already accepted that. You know, we already kind of accepted that and we know there is a trade-off. I will let them know where I am and they will give me a better service sometime in the future. So this kind of compromise is there and uh, we need to live in this reality. Now, uh, our task as researchers, as my task as I see it, is try to establish this link and reduce this latencies of months to years to, to milliseconds or in terms of planning, maybe maybe months and uh, make it really, really fast. Also cheap. I also want to make it cheaper because I, I know running the service and supporting these demand models is a, is a costly business. And the operational cost of running a good demand model is, is high. It can be done cheaper. Okay, the data. Uh, I will focus on the data that comes from the private sector, essentially through IT companies. And in my talk, I will focus mainly on the data that comes from the telecoms. And the telecom companies, they've been collecting this data since their beginning, since the very, very beginning, because they needed the system to actually uh, send you a bill at the end of the month. They've been collecting every event that your phone uh, generates, communicating with their network. And these events were phone calls, messages, and they've been recording all this in high detail. So they do have very high volumes of reasonably uh, dense in space and time data set about uh, where the people are. They also got, what interesting th interestingly what they also got is this implicit social network of users because they know who people call to. So they, they, they know quite, quite a bit. Um, and we wanted to, you know, to, to work with data like that, and I will guide you through several examples of what you could do with the data uh, that telecoms got. And uh, interestingly, there are different things you can do, and it depends on how close you are to the original disaggregated data source. However, even if you're really far from, from, from this data source and you can only work with the aggregates, you can also do a lot. And uh, we'll, we'll go through these levels of access and uh, digitalization that, that you, you, you got. Okay, so in essence what they do, as I told you, is they collect the timestamped events of a phone communicating to their networks. So their spatial resolution varies uh, in the downtown, the coverage of a cellular antennas is quite good. Uh, you know, every corner would have a, a little, little, little antenna. Uh, in the countryside, uh, one antenna could cover 20, 25 more you know, uh, vast areas. So it varies. In terms of the temporal resolution, um, it's getting better every second. Because modern phones, especially if you got data plan, who doesn't? Uh, they are always on, the data plan is always on, the phone always communicates with, this, with the network, so they collect thousands of location samples for every phone they, they, they serve. Okay, so let's see if a company is not comfortable sharing the disaggregated data, and no company is comfortable with that because of the privacy concerns. However, what they can share is some aggregates, and aggregates are already very, very useful. So let's see what we can do if we do know the aggregated number of people connected to the, uh, every antenna in the city. What we can do is we can first try and downscale it to the level we are interested in, to the level of the, to the street level, the level of the roads. How we do that? Well, we need to know a little bit about the infrastructure itself, where the antennas are, what is the coverage. Uh, what is the signal strength on the street level, and uh, 
the, uh, the telecoms, they do service like that, so we know that. We really want to know something about our population. We need to have the ground truth, because every operator gets only a share of the market, so you need to be able to rescale what operator says to the full population. So you need to, to, to have this ground truth and some method to rescale from one to another. And you need to know the map. Right, you, have, you, you do have to have the map, the one you will use to downscale the data into. Uh, we worked a lot on these methods, and uh, you know, the idea here is, is pretty clear. So you, you know the aggregate for a particular location, you know the geometry. So how would you then use these two pieces of information to, 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 you know, uh, to reinterpolate people uh, knowing the, uh, the, the, the geometry and knowing the coverage. So how do you downscale it intelligently on this uh, more, more detailed uh, geometry that you've got about cities? So you could do that. Uh, you could do it relatively fast. You could do it in an incremental fashion. And what it gives you is that you would have uh, almost you know, live update on the population density in cities. And that's already very interesting. So uh, you do all these corrections and you dial scale to the street level and you do have this real-time population density in cities. That's, that's a, a, a nice thing you could have without compromising privacy, without uh, you know, asking them for, for detailed data. Only on the aggregates you already could have that. And uh, of course, since you know the road network, you can apply the same methods to figure out the traffic densities. And here our work was a little bit more detailed uh, because um, you know, knowing the, the population density is good for traffic, we really want to know it in a very, very detailed. You know, and on every street segment, we really want to know the, the volumes very, very precise way. And the reason is that you know, it is a cheap way to substitute this uh, or complement the loop detectors. Because the telecoms already run this infrastructure. There's no additional costs for them. Uh, they, they, they already do all that. So there's no additional cost for us and for them to, to transform it into the traffic density, so the volume estimates. That's what we did. Uh, and uh, to be absolutely precise, we validated these methods on the uh, uh, on, on a well-developed simulation, right? So this is a micro sim from, from San Diego, I think. And uh, uh, we validated this method by actually simulating the drivers, uh, putting the cell phones in their cars. And uh, as we know, every car in the US very soon will have a sim card installed into it. So our job will be even easier. Um, so we simulated the traffic and then we simulated the drivers uh, behavior with the phone, and we've shown that actually uh, if we calibrate the cellular co coverage uh, in a good way, our precision will be very, very high in how we can recover the volumes on the, on, on the main uh, freeways and the main arterials. If the, uh, uh, if, the, if the telecom doesn't really know the signal strength in the area, if they have not measured the coverage, the precision is not as good. It's still better than nothing, though. Uh, so with a little additional effort, they do have the data to help us measure volumes uh, on, on every link, which is, which is quite a bit. Other things we could do. Let's say we, we do have access to more disaggregated data, and we can actually track people through the cells. So we could start connecting the dots into flows. And the first thing we could do is connect them into some, some, some you know, pretty standard defined chunks like, okay, let, let's see. We know the population density at, at uh, night time, so these are people at home. We know population density at the office hours, these are people at work. Let's see how they move, right? Let's build OD tables. That's so easy. Uh, you, just, you, just, you just aggregate data that you've got, and uh, we use Berkeley developed technologies. They are all open source. Um, the, the, the tools are out there. And uh, you could build all the tables for a particular scenario that you're interested in, for a particular time frame that you're interested in, with a click of a button. 
And we compared what we produced from the data we got from AT&T for the Bay Area compared to what MTC produced with, the, uh, with their demand model. A very good demand model, by the way. So uh, let's see what we've got, and I will show you some comparison for the Bay Area. Uh, we all know the Bay Area, but I, I want you to kind of get used to the geography, right? I will show some screenshot like this, where I will compare how the demand uh, we estimated from the cellular data compares to what MTC estimated through their survey. Uh, we did the recalibration. Uh, AT&T got very nice uh, penetration rate, but it varies. So sometimes it's 25, sometimes it's 40%. It varies geographically, so you need to account for that. Uh, we did that. And uh, the things that we see immediately is that areas where you have new developments, uh, and uh, it, you know, it all is happening now, these are pretty new developments for you know, maybe last year they completed the construction here. Nothing of that in the surveys. So MTC model just doesn't know about that. Uh, and we see it immediately. We also see where these people travel for work. And I think this is the, the, the main uh, advantage of the cellular data. Because you know, commute models, the OD models or OD tables or demand forecast for commutes, you could get quite precisely. You know, it's not a big deal asking people where they live, where they work. You know, the surveys are very good. But you know, looking at uh, where they travel during the day, looking at this, all this detail, you cannot, you cannot do through surveys. Right? So uh, and this is, I think, the main advantage of the cellular data is in here. You could also see things that are not in the surveys simply because things changed, right? Let's say in the number of trips into the zones, right? I'm, sorry, I'm showing the inaccuracies of how many trips go into the zone now. They, they miss a lot in the SFO. You can speculate about the reasons. They meet quite a bit uh, simply because the, you know, the employers in the Silicon Valley change the number of employees, sometimes drastically. Google increased the number of employees uh, in you know, two times. They got two times more people going into their campus now. It's not in the service, and we could see it immediately. Same thing, you know, Tesla reopened the production in the factory. There's at least 3,000 jobs here. So there are 3,000 people coming into this uh, zone, but not covered by service, and so on. You know, you could even see smaller signal. You could see that number of students increased in colleges and things like that. And you can do this analysis on demand. You know, if you get a scenario, you need an OD table. Here you go. You want to know how many people go to the airports, where they travel from. Here you go. You got the catchment area for the airports. It's all great. Um, our probably the closest project where we get to like real life application is with the SFCTA where we will support them in the uh, Treasure Island Mobility Management Project. We look into the current pattern of um, travel of the residents and uh, you know, they plan to bring 20,000 more people onto the island. Uh, we'll try to support them and help them um, see how the planning actually worked when they implemented. Because they want to put a new ferry line, they want to uh, improve the, the bus lines across the bridges and so on. And there are interesting questions they, they need to figure out. I mean, do you need a ferry to Auckland too or not? And all these questions need very detailed data support. And so probably that would be our you know, like really down-to-earth project where we will connect the AT&T through Berkeley with SFCTA. I'm uh, really looking forward to this one. Okay, so what if you can go even more into the detail, right? What if you start connecting not just into the OG tables, but what if you start looking into how people actually travel? You could infer route flows, right? Instead of just general categories, you can infer route flows. So for every individual, you would know how, which route the person took without us making assumptions on the equilibrium, without modeling traffic assignment, you can just get it from data. And the methods we developed, they actually take two sources into account. They, you know, they, they also look into the counts, on the volume counts and the, uh, on the loop detectors, cellular data in, in, in two shapes and forms. One is the uh, 
the ODs that we infer from cellular data, and second is the sequence of cell that every user is going through during the travel. What you can get from that? Well, you can infer exact route that people travel. Why is it important? It's because without making assumptions on, on, on traffic assignment <coughs> side, you can answer really key questions. You know, who exactly contributes to congestion on these roads? Who exactly is driving through? Who exactly is in this traffic jam? And who would be uh, affected if, if there is an accident here? You know? Which areas would be affected? Who would be late home? Things like that. Uh, and, and many other questions that you could answer right from data if, if you know this route flow. Um, so we, we put some quite, quite a work here. And this is an example from the I210 work. So this work goes to the project that Berkeley leads on the connected corridors. And uh, you know, if you're interested in rerouting or in, in coordinating rerouting and connecting the freeways to arterials network, maximizing the throughput in case of accidents, that is an essential piece of information. Okay, um, now how good this route, in, route inference works? We made experiments um, looking into, so what if we got a typical geography with typical coverage of antennas and the accuracy of what uh, we got now in the current infrastructure is about 90%. So for 90% of people we could recover the exact route. Uh, and uh, I think it's, it's quite enough. It's, of course, it's application dependent, but the accuracy is quite good. And if we look at what telecoms are doing, and they're installing much more cells, then now precision goes down drastically. If, if they install what they call the femta cells now, uh, that will help serve uh, the, the modern phones with transition from 4G to 5G, the coverage will be much better, the spatial resolution will be much better. Uh, things will go, uh, go even better. Okay. Finally, um, can we connect these dots into the sequence of activities? Can we also build something that would be comparable to typical activity-based model used in planning? And here, you know, we will be competing with very, very well-developed approaches. Because if you look, let's say, what MTC is doing for, for, for the Bay Area, they are doing very a comprehensive modeling. You know, they, they go through synthesizing the population from calibrated from the surveys. They, they model uh, lots of decisions. And here's accumulated knowledge from um, the discrete choice modeling frameworks accumulated through years and mul multitudes of surveys. So we're competing with very developed framework. And this is why I'm saying that probably big data in terms of the data available to telecoms will complement it. It will improve it in certain things. It will improve it in, in you know, uh, modeling the location choice for the secondary activities. Uh, it will improve uh, probably the mode recognition. It, it will, the, the, the mode choice modeling. Because, you know, simply because, let's say, if you travel from, from the East Bay to the San Francisco, the pattern or the sequence of cells that you go through, if you drive or if you take BART, is, is very different. You can classify it, you know, and you can detect the, the mode from the cellular data quite easily. Um, and your sample size is huge. You know the mode choice for a million of people. So you can calibrate models very precisely for the region. So you could improve, you know, if, if you work hard, you can improve nearly every box in this, in this framework of uh, activity-based modeling through discrete choice. And um, this is what we started doing. Uh, we um, process the AT&T data uh, into individual trips. We used some machine learning there uh, because the nature of the data is very different. You, you need to infer those activities and uh, they're hidden, you know. Uh, in, 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 this, in, in the data of where people are, they don't tell you that this is their work place or this is their home or you need to infer these hidden states from data, so we applied some machine learning there. And what we arrived is, uh, we call the Smart Bay. And uh, I will show you this video that we prepared for media. So it's not very scientific, but it uh, at least illustrates what, what we can do. Um, 
If the soundtrack is annoying, just tell me. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll try to shut it off. Uh, so, yeah, as I tell you, uh, we, uh, we worked with the cellular data of, uh, with AT&T. They've got uh, more than a million people living in the Bay Area. We consider the same division into TAZs as accepted for, for the Bay. That's uh, 1,454 TAZs. We included BART, Caltrain, uh, AC Transit, and Mooney into, into our model. Uh, operationally, we only actually use BART, but uh, <laughs> the, you know, modeling the transit in detail is quite difficult. Anyway, uh, so we recognize this, acti this activity sequences as home to work and secondary activities for every, for every AT&T user. Rescaled it into the virtual population. Uh, we had to go through very uh, serious review on privacy. We had to show that you cannot, from our agent-based simulation, revert back to the individual users. It was a very serious exercise for us, um, and we built this uh, this traffic-based, uh, you know, this uh, agent-based model. Uh, it's essentially every software piece we use is open source. Uh, only the data, uh, the agent data, is proprietary. There's this privacy restrictions. And um, I, I think it's something new because this simulation is, you know, it's so close to reality uh, that you can use it for scenarios you, you never thought you could be using the simulations for. And uh, I'll show you some examples of where this will go in the future in, the, in our work. So what you see here is, you know, this, this sparks is this moments when people arrive home or they arrive to work. And uh, why it's important is because uh, you, know, you could start connecting this information with other information. How the traf transport traffic demand and traffic pattern is related to the demand on the electricity network. Because people arrive home, they turn on the, the utilities and so on. You can make these connections now. That's, that's what we call smart cities, by the way. This is very important. Anyways, uh, so thanks for, for watching this. This is how the project works. I described it, I think, in detail. So we got this at and data. We do machine learning in recognizing these daily tours for individuals uh, with open source tools. We use open source mobility simulators to uh, actually put it on the, on the road network to reproduce mobility. Now, of course, we need to validate it. Right, and uh, the validation procedure here is, is pretty straightforward. We use the PEMS data on, uh, on the freeways to look that the volumes are uh, as, we, uh, as we observe. It's, it's fine, you know, this is a good exercise. And, and if you work on, on validating these models, uh, and it's a hard work, uh, but uh, uh, we are within these limits of the uh, FHWA you know, they, they define this, the precision levels for different, uh, different volumes now, so we're good. Um, now, where are we, we see these models going? Well, we do want to use this information about the, the people actually are not just disconnected trails, they're connected. So there's a lot of social influence going on. Especially when you get new modes, like, you know, you get uh, new, new vehicles. The, the transition into this new mode, so the, uh, the adoption of the EVs, electric vehicles, would probably be influenced by uh, who is talking to whom. You know, if I'm saying good things about Uber, my friends would probably try it and use it. So my demand forecast will have to include the social network information. They will need to include data about who my friends are and so on. So we think this social influence will be a, a big thing in the future. So we'll, we'll be building models for that. Um, we are starting to use these simulation models um, for projects like this. So we got this recent NSF project where we look into what's going to change if we got five meter sea level rise and the storm. And you could see in the maps, a lot of things would change. The whole sections of freeways will be flooded. And the question is, you know, do we abandon the 
37, or we still build infrastructure to, to protect it. Uh, the, the Treasure Island, Treasure Island will be gone. They will, they will actually increase the, 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 its level by five meters. They will put five more meters of the ground before they actually start construction on the island. So all these questions, they, they could be answered with uh, you know, having the detailed transportation um, the simulation on the, on the back end. Um, other things, we, we started to look at closer into the um, TNCs and uh, we tried to work closer with uh, Lyft and Uber and these folks. Uh, we try to see what we can do with our data to understand how their presence changes demand patterns and um, you know, they do certain things internally, but uh, we, we, we also try to use our data to, you know, and, and their data, which is not so easy to get, um, but it's worth trying uh, to, to see what's, what's happening there. And uh, we built some, well, some simulations here too. I'm not sure if I could get this running. Maybe not, it's not essential. Okay. So, uh, to conclude, I'd like to, to thank all the people who work with this. Uh, it's uh, people work, who are working with us with the, you know, in the projects supported by UC Connect and the Caltrans. There are people working in the Connected Corridors project at Berkeley, and there's uh, quite a few people working directly in at and on this. And uh, thank you very much. So our third speaker was able to make it on time, despite some uh, disruptions in his flight. So uh, we'll get him set up quickly. So uh, Christoph, if you wanna, if you wanna come up. All right. So yeah. So here you have both of your videos, and then I just I will try my best. Yeah, we'll just put this in full screen mode. You have been like a five minute warning? Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much for having me and sorry for coming quite late, but the plane was quite substantially delayed. Um, I'm not a transportation scientist, so I hope I will be using the right language here. My, my background is in massive integration of heterogeneous data and knowledge representation, so I'm combining cognitive science, artificial intelligence research with spatial temporal questions. And, and I hope some of that will be quite exciting for you. I would like to talk about work that we did about, that we started about five years ago now, about what we call semantic signatures. And I will focus on the application for what we call social sensing in urban environments. So let's dive right into that. So <clears throat> a lot of the work, also a lot of work uh, that I'm doing is these days in machine learning and pattern mining. We just saw some of that work. But um, machine learning and pattern mining make some very broad assumptions about the availability of data, about biases in the data, about what patterns actually mean, about having a rich set of features available. And they also have multiple drawbacks about um, what, how those patterns relate to human cognition, to terms that humans use in everyday language and so forth. And they also require that the massive amounts of data are somehow available and, and processable to you. So what we do, we combine machine learning approaches and, and um, data mining approaches with what is called um, semantic or logical frameworks. Maybe you heard about the semantic web or linked data or formal knowledge representation as it originated in, in artificial intelligence research. So let me give you an example. This is not supposed to happen. There should be a, a video here, but I was told that it's not going to work. Uh, no, it's not going to work. You have to exit the full screen. I will try. So now it's, where is it, documents? Desktop. 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 Yeah. I'm new to Windows, so if I... <laughs> okay. This one here? Yes. Okay. I will, I will find my way through it, don't worry. Let's try this way. So what you see here, and let me briefly stop that, 
because now the text on the slide is gone. So what you see here is something that really caught the attention of a lot of people working on, on social media and, and um, also the visualization of large amounts of data is an, a video created by Foursquare, I think like three years ago or two years ago, that where Foursquare, which is a big um, social online social network where people can check into places, this means that they go somewhere, for instance, to a restaurant or to work, and they take out their smartphone and they use the Foursquare app to say, hey, I just arrived at that place, and it's visible to the public. So they go uh, to a bus station, check in, they go to even a police station, they check in, you know, people do funny things. <laughs> so um, they really do. Um, so what Foursquare did is they collected data for one entire year, and this means millions and millions and millions and millions of these check-ins, and then they rendered that using their uh, eight or nine main categories, so residential areas, the category they call food, arts and entertainment, college and universities, nightlife sports, great outdoors, I will talk about that in a second, and so forth and so forth, and then they created this nice animation where each of these dots, and there are really millions of them, is an individual check-in. So somebody telling everybody out there, I am here, and the lines are just sequences of check-ins. So this is what you see. You, there should be a clock somewhere over there. Over there, it's 1 p.m. now, 2 p.m. You see the traffic into the city. You see that the food category is raising in importance now in the evening, then the nightlife spots are becoming more important. And please watch on what's going to happen here in about like 10 seconds or something like that. Right here. Here you go. So any idea what that could be? Hard to say, but it's clearly something. Excuse me? Maybe, yeah. So while this is all nice as a visualization and quite impressive, it has quite some drawbacks. Namely that, first of all, this is not an interactive system. You can't stop at any time and say, hey, this one dot, this one check-in. Who is that? Or what location is that? Or if you see this moving object, what exactly is that? It's a pre-rendered video, so you take it like it is, you look at it, you get all fancy and excited about that, and then basically you move on. So there's no way to zoom in, to pan in, to click on individual information items. There's also one thing that, um, is particularly interesting for me is that it's like a, we call this the Facebook day. This is not a real day. This is all the data from one year aggregated into a single day, which is quite odd if you think about that, because all the patterns that we know about, you know, weekends and weekdays and seasons, all that disappears here, which leads to the funny effect that you see a lot of patterns there, and especially you guys probably see way more than I do, but most of them are not actual patterns because they don't fit into the human scale of experience. So there is no any day in reality. There are only Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays and so forth and so forth. Another interesting thing is that Foursquare uses um, point of interest taxonomy. So if you want to check into a place, it's always a point of interest. This is a point of interest. Um, the pub next door is a point of interest. And there are more than 400 of those. And therefore, a lot of what you saw depends on how they are categorized. What counts as food? What is a nightlife spot? What counts as college and universities, for instance? And, you know, they make this for a commercial reason, mainly to, to you know, generate advertisement, to set out coupons and stuff like that. So they make some decisions that, you know, are maybe a little bit on the, on the unusual side. So cemeteries, for instance, count as great outdoors, for instance, which may be true, but I think it's not very, very intuitive. So what you see here, again, are many, 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 many patterns, and everybody who's doing big data is so excited about patterns, and then they often forget to ask themselves, well, do those patterns actually mean something, right? And one more issue with, with the use of Foursquare and other social media in general, we use Twitter, Foursquare, we use Twitter, for instance, for origin destination trips and stuff like that, is that all the data that you get by studying what we call data traces. So we basically study what other people leave around them as data, right? Check-ins, um, messages on social media, um, Wi-Fi broadcasting signals. Um, that all relies on the fact that hopefully this is true what they are doing, that they are really going to this place. 
and also that those places are really what we believe they are. And if you start searching the data, you find, for instance, that many Foursquare users add their own home and type it as a castle. So there are a lot of castles in Los Angeles, for instance, but you know they're all residential areas. And they also, um, Foursquare has this funny thing where it assumes that taxis are points of interest, but they are not because they are moving, right? So you have to do a lot of data cleaning. Um, so I hope this, this video that you saw was still quite excited, quite exciting for you to see how you can use social media and traces that people, data traces that people generate to come up with models about how urban systems function. And now let me dive into a very different um, world, the world of my research. And then at the very end, I will come back to the motivating video. So um, let's start with something that is maybe even less familiar with you, namely space observatories and their sensors. And you may think that I'm, I'm really crazy now, but you will see I will, I will bring that message home. So if you look at the, the so-called great observatories of NASA, then you have, for instance, Chandra, you have Spitzer, you have the Hubble Space Telescope, and each of them senses electromagnetic radiation in a specific band, a specific a set of uh, wavelengths. So for instance, Chandra works in the X-ray band, Hubble Space Telescope in the visible band, and Spitzer Telescope in the infrared band. And if they study a remote object, for instance, in this case, um, I think that's an, a galaxy called M101, then each of them contributes specific signals back to us that we can use to learn something about this particular galaxy. But what makes them really what, what generates the most exciting scientific findings is when you actually combine those bands. So you say, I take the X-ray data from Chandra, I take the visible band data from Hubble, I take the infrared data from Spitzer, and then I can see the whole picture, get a holistic view of what's happening here. And whenever you see such a nice, we call this false color composite image, then it's a combination of multiple bands. So this is not only used in astrophysics, it's all over the place. It's in chemistry, it's in, in the medical domain, and in many other domains, even in many domains in, in computing. And the idea is always kind of the same. So let me give you just one example from remote sensing. So if you have a remote sensing device, then you can uh, try to measure such spectral signatures, which are just defined as the combination of emitted, reflected, and absorbed electromagnetic radiation at a varying wavelength, those are called the bands, and a signature is just a combination of all that bands that jointly allows you to identify a certain type of feature. And it's important to realize that this is a type of feature, not a specific feature, so you can recognize this is a forest. This is, for instance, the signature of um, bare red brick or something like that. And if you look at this example also taken from, from NASA, you see that for some types of features, like paving concrete or bare red brick, you can tell them apart in nearly uh, each part of the spectrum. If you look at deciduous versus conifer trees, like you see over here, you either need one specific spectrum or you need to combine multiple of those bands so that they jointly form a signature. So how does this relate to the transportation work and, and the four square traffic simulation? Well, we took this spectral signature analogy four or five years ago and created, oh, sorry, the other way around. We took the spectral signature idea and created an analogy four or five years ago that we call semantic signatures. And instead of having big observatories in space, we have our own small observatories. They don't look at the space out there. They look at what we call the data universe. So we collect massive amounts of traces from cell phones, Wi-Fi data, social media, the news, Wikipedia, everything we can gather. And then we try to split this into the bands. Our bands are not based on electromagnetic radiation. They're based on signals from humans, what people say about places, when they arrive at places, how the places are spread over space. And in our tradition in geographic information science, we typically assign things either to the geospatial band, the temporal band, and the thematic band. And without going into details, I'm listing some of the, the methods that we used here. So in fact, we used, for instance, for thematic bands, so what people say about places, techniques from machine learning like latent Dirichlet allocation. We used a lot of spatial statistics for the spatial bands. 
we have some statistics like Watson's T2 sample test for uh, the temporal bands. But what I really like to do now for the next 15 minutes is to show you just by example what the idea is and why we believe this is so powerful. Because our background is in, is in formal knowledge representation, we have a formal model that brings all those bands together. I'm not going into, into the details here, but I hope the take-home take message that I want to bring across is that during the last four years we collected hundreds of those bands and, and we applied them to a lot of different tasks, including um, the categorization of places. So there's no label for a place and we can, with a very high probability, tell you what kind of place this is. If the place, for instance, changes from a, from a restaurant to a nightclub and we don't have up-to-date data within a few days or weeks, we can tell you actually what the category of the place is. If you bring data together, and I believe the beauty of big data is not the size of the data, but the heterogeneity of the data, then you need to do data integration, data conflation. You have to say that this record is from the same person like this record. You have to say that data about this place is also comparable to data about that place, or that both places described in those data sets are the same. So we could show that we can use our signatures very successfully there, also in semantic enrichment, data cleaning, visualization, and even in tasks like reverse geocoding, we could, for instance, um, outsmart the competition, including Google, quite nicely. And we also use it for ontology alignment, but I guess that may be a little bit esoteric in that context, so I'm not going to comment on that. Let me instead dive just into some examples of what we are doing here. So <clears throat> let me try to give you an intuition what, for instance, this thematic band is about. At the very core of the thematic band lies a very interesting realization that when people talk, including what I'm saying right now, even if what I'm saying is not geo-specific, I'm not saying Santa Barbara, Sacramento, or something like that, but by talking to you, the probability of me uttering certain statements can be geolocated or can be georeferenced. If I would now start talking, for instance, about beach volleyball at the ocean and I would talk about the dolphins and, and canoeing, you would say, he's most likely at the beach, he's clearly not in the Rockies. If I would be talking about snow and hiking and waterfalls, well, I wouldn't be in Southern California, right? And surprisingly, that works even for terms that you may have not recognized as having any relation to geographic space. And I will show you that um, in just a second. So let me just show you one example here. This is a Wikipedia page, the Wikipedia page about Santa Barbara. We do the same for news pages. We do the same for Foursquare and Yelp and Twitter and Instagram. There are so many of them right now. What you see here, and I hope you can read this, is that Wikipedia articles often have a geolocation. That's the part over here in greenish. And if you go through the text and read the text, and of course we use machine learning to, to analyze the text, we, we do not actually read that then you see that some of the text says Santa Barbara is a county seat, yada, 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 it is a city, and so forth, and so forth. So some of the language is about types of features, right? So Santa Barbara being of type city. Some of the language, like climate, Mediterranean, mountains, is re relevant to the location. So let's say I step out of Santa Barbara, I go to the nearby community, which is Golita, then Golita is not Santa Barbara, it's not a county seat, but it will also talk about Mediterranean climate and mountains. So there are certain aspects of such a Wikipedia article which are variant or invariant in space, and others like the ones that are in yellow here that talk about the census, that talk about economy, service sector, education, crime, employment, airports, institutions, governments, they don't vary uniformly across space, they vary by type. So if this wouldn't be an article about a city, but about a mountain range, I promise there would be no talk about unemployment there, right? This sounds quite trivial, but it's a very, very powerful idea. So if you actually collect data from millions of sources, in this case, for instance, this is half a million of georeferenced Wikipedia articles, and you learn the language models and you train those language models, here we use the technique called latent Dirichlet clear allocation, then you can derive topics out of that. And this topic, for instance, talks about industry, factories, companies. Don't get confused, those terms are stamped. So they, they appear a little bit shorter than they are usually. Um, operations, areas, development, machine, machinery, workers. And you see here the spatial distribution. You see it the East Coast here, you very clearly see the West Coast. And the second one here talks about falls, waterfalls, rivers, um, cascades, 
height, pools, view, um, rocks, parks, and so forth. And here you see very heavily, for instance, um, the, the Rocky Mountains, and I can tell you these over there, I think, are the pennies. So I hope this gives you a little bit of an intuition, but you will say, okay, so now I know where people make certain statements, what they say in their, if they're in certain regions, and that's not what, yet what we need. What we need is to aggregate the information to the type level. Again, not just to have some signature, but to have one that is meaningful to humans. So if you would actually collect all the articles from news, from Wikipedia and so forth that talk about cities, and then see which topics are typically present there, and you would, for instance, order them just to give you an intuition, and you would do the same for the towns, then you would see that the city and the town articles are quite similar, but the mountain articles are quite dissimilar. So this just confirms our intuition that this approach really works, and to give you just a more graphical representation, you see again, you see London here, you see California, so Sacramento and in the Bay Area and LA and so forth, you see New York, and here the second one is about the mountains, so you see the pennies, you see again the Appalachians here, you see the, what is it, Great Western Divide or something like that, you see the, the Himalayas, you see the Alps, so it works quite, um, quite nicely. So I hope this gives you a little bit the, an idea of what we are doing. We are mining massive information, we are cleaning it, we are enriching it, we are looking for patterns, but then we aggregate all the, level, all the data to the type level and then when we found, for instance, when we, when we go out and we find a new text, we can tell you not only about which region this text is or where the text is written, we can tell you about what the text actually is in terms of the type of place. You can play the very same game for uh, temporal data. So, as I said, people use this check-in applications to tell us when they went where, and if you study this over millions and millions and millions of check-ins, you can derive such temporal signatures. And here you have two examples, um, again, just the visualizations to make it easier uh, to understand, of a winery and a nightclub and a football stadium and an airport, and you see that the daily patterns differ quite a bit. So airports have this kind of pattern where they are visited at all times, so it's like a non-pattern, so to speak, and nightclubs are visited during the, the weekends. That's kind of obvious for us, right? but it's not obvious for machines. But you may say that the wineries and the nightclubs, they have kind of a similar pattern on the weekly basis. So if you would take another band, and here I'm using again the spectral signature language, and you would check the data at an um, hourly basis, you would find that wineries, while they're visited mostly on the weekends, they're mostly visited from like five to, to eight and the nightclubs, well, no surprise for humans, they are visited late in the night. <clears throat> you can do the very same for the spatial band. You can, again, collect, in this case, it's, I think, a quarter of a million uh, points of interest in the city of London, and you can um, make computational models about similarity between types of features, so that bars and pubs are very similar, restaurants and bars are kind of similar, but post offices and police stations are quite different. And then you can just make simple um, spatial statistics to analyze what kind of places typically occur, occur together, and um, you can develop a fancy statistics for that that we did. It measures the interaction not only between the same feature across space, but also about semantic similarity. So what this tells you is that it's, it's good to think about it as being a good tool for betting. If I would take you into a place, you know, I would cover your eyes and I would take you into a place and I would, you know, lift the cover and you would see you're in a bar and I would ask, what is the building next door? Then if you want to make a good bet, you would say it's either a bar, it's a restaurant or it's a cafe or it's a nightclub, right? It's very unlikely a kindergarten. If I would do the very same and I would bring you to a post office and I would ask, well, what do you think is the building next door? And you are good at betting. The last thing you would say is the next building next door is also a post office because post offices don't cluster together. Police stations don't cluster together, but bars do. So what the statistics do here is it tells you that if there's a bar, then in close spatial distance and in close semantic distance are bars and bar-like features, nightclubs, yada, yada, yada. If you're at a post office, it's very unlikely to have an even similar feature nearby. Why is that such a powerful idea to, 
create computational models for that, because if you conflate data from different sources, like OpenStreetMap that you may be familiar, familiar with, with Wikimapia, they all claim very high coverage. But if you look at the data, there's only a little bit of overlap. So you need to figure out, is this post office and this post office that are very close in terms of geographic coordinates and maybe address matching the same or is it not? Or a user adds a new feature. Is this a new post office or is it not? So if there's already a post office, you can be sure it's the same. If there's a bar, it's a little bit of a more difficult story. So we actually use this analogy to, to sensors and observations in, in quite more detail than just the, the bands and signatures. So if you look at, again, the domain of remote sensing, you can think about the spatial resolution of a sensor. So if this is a one kilometer resolution, of the southern part of Florida, you can make out quite some details, including the keys. If this is, I think, a seven or nine miles resolution, you already see that what you can learn, what you can study gets crisper, and this is, I believe, 17 miles resolution. So this is the spatial resolution of a sensor, like a satellite-mounted sensor. There's also the temporal resolution. So let's say you want to study a wildfire, and you would say, I take data from the Landsat mission, then that's not a very good idea because Landsat will return every 16 days to the same location. So you need data with a high temporal resolution so that it will revisit the same spot over and over again. Spectral resolution is just the width and the number and the position of those bands, and the radiometric resolution is just how fine are they, what kind of differences can they detect. We brought the whole idea to the semantic signatures as well, and this was very important for us to study regional effects. So once you understand that you can take all those massive amounts of data that users generated and you don't need to violate their privacy, you just aggregate the data to the signature level, to the level of types of places, and then you can use this for a lot of very interesting tasks, you start to ask yourself, well, how, how unique are those patterns for certain regions or can I take my signatures and just apply them globally? So we did studies on and the regional effects of temporal signatures. And as you can see here, for Los Angeles, Chicago, and New York, and we also did this for, for Shanghai, China, <clears throat> people behave towards theme parks, so the red ones are theme parks, differently in Los Angeles than in Chicago or New York, which is most likely due to the weather. We have these big parks like Disneyland that are all day, all week attractions and in Chicago and New York, it, it looks quite differently. Again, this is aggregated from millions of check-ins. If you look at drugstores, then no matter where you go, the pattern is more or less the same. So this is quite important for our work on indexing to see how much of those signatures we mine only have a local scope and how many of these can be used all across the United States and even um, compared to, to China. You can play the very same game about the temporal resolution, I'm not going into too much detail here, the important take home message is that it gives you a tool to come up with a formal framework to understand what is the resolution, what are the limits um, of your data and let me show you one more example. You can ask yourself interesting questions about data categorization like if you would compare all articles for instance or all human data traces from a certain type of point of interest to another type, then you can make assumptions about how likely you are going to be able to tell them apart. So this is similar to the radiometric resolution that I mentioned before. So these are the mountains. If you think back to the my, my mountain city example, we are very easily able to tell apart mountains from non-mountains. If you look at cities, telling apart cities from non-cities is a bit more difficult because we also have data about uh, museums and parks and, and stadiums, and they are all parts of cities, so this makes it a difficult task. And if you try to tell apart towns, it's equally um, difficult. So I, I, I promise you that the, at the end of my talk, I will, I will bring the, the message home to this pulse of the city from Foursquare. And I would like to show you what we did as a reaction. So we do quite a lot of work with these signatures in data cleaning, data conflation, uh, outlier detection, and so forth and so forth. But we just wanted to, you know, to outsmart those guys. We are always you not know, trying to, to be better than the other ones. So we did one for Los Angeles, but keep in mind, they have millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions, and, millions, and I can go on like that, of data. 
what we do is we create signatures of a lot of data, but once you create the signatures, they're absolutely tiny. So the memory footprint of what I'm showing you here by the power of semantics is really absolutely tiny and why their work works for San Francisco and San Francisco and San Francisco only. You can take our signatures, you can plug them on any other city you like in the US and they will work quite well. So what I'm going to show you is this one here. Again, this nice broken link. So, um, we asked the second, I'm a Windows snoop. Oh yes, yes, yeah, right. Sorry for that. So this is our system. I will show you a little bit more in a second. You see also the, the hours of the day and day of the weeks. So you see our categories here and you see how LA wakes up and then you know it's 7 p.m. and you see the different kinds of places trend and then LA goes to sleep and wakes up the next day and so forth and so forth. So you may say, well, you took a data, an inspiration from San Francisco for a video and you created a video for LA, so what's the, the real point here? Well, the point is that ours is an interactive system that you can actually use for something. And let me show you how that works. So this is the Poipulse web page. You can go there, it's actually online. And what seems to you like streets, I hope you can see this highway street, is not. These are 200,000 points of interest. They are just so dense that they appear to you as streets. And you see you can select a time of the day here. And because you zoomed out to the maximum extent, you see just all venues together and you can see how the, the patterns changes over the course of the day. And you can, of course, click on all of that and get information. And if you start to zoom in, you see our categories. And by the way, our categories are derived from a combination of semantic technologies, so top-down knowledge engineering and machine learning. So we believe they, they are more sensical than the, the ones that I just described in, in Facebook, but you can, in Foursquare, but you can judge on your own. So now you see suddenly the different top-level categories and you see individual places and you can click at them and interact with them. You can go hour by hour or you can select a certain day. You can go into even more detail and then select individual places at individual times. Um, and finally, you can select a certain place. And now if you select a certain place, this is a launch, for instance, then we don't only offer you this crisp, simple classification into food, nightlife, or whatnot. Um, we have more than 400 categories, but we show you how they are built up in terms of the top-level categories. So, for instance, if this is a, a launch, then it's... A, you know, mostly an entertainment and nightlife place, but you probably also agree it's also an eating and dining place. So we have a broader way to, to talk about category membership. So this is all now def default behavior. You can go hour through hour and see really how LA wakes up and how people go to places and how certain places um, you know, gain popularity based on their type. So when people visit retail locations and people visit theme parks, um, and all this be default behavior allows us to simulate the city like in the video I showed you before and to take the same signatures to yet another city and do the very same game. But the real interest is when you combine this default behavior with what we call the burst mode, so real-time data. So all the data sources we use like Yelp and Yikyak is the newest kid around the block in social media and Foursquare and Facebook, they all have very limited APIs for public access. So we can't say, give me real-time data for all of LA. And as I hope, con I convince you, you don't even have to. But if you zoom into a very specific area, then we can actually query this smaller area in real time because then we are not hitting their API limits, so we are within their legal bounds. And this means that we can get really uh, on-the-fly data about how many people are at those places. So there are four people here, three people there, two people there. Of course, this doesn't mean that there are only two people in that, I don't know, light club. It just means two users of Foursquare, and we have the same for Instagram, yada, yada, yada. And what you see here, it would be usually an animation, is that you then also have tweets coming in in real time and, and um, Instagram messages coming in in real time. And now you can start to ask yourself questions like, According to the default behavior, this area should be, you know, in deep, deep night sleep. Why is there so much activity there, right? Or you could say, well, this is supposed to be a bakery, but it's 9 p.m. Why are people there? Maybe the type change or something like that, and we used it for a number of these applications. So um, 
just two more take-home messages slide and I think I'm out of time. What I try to show here is an important argument of the semantic web and linked data community, namely what is called the smart data versus smart applications argument. So if you are, some of you may, may be software engineers or at least have experience in software engineering, developing smart applications is a very, very, very hard job. It's almost impossible, but even if you have a smart application, it doesn't make your data any smarter. And if somebody changes the database, changes the database schema, you get new data, you get a new data source, then all these applications have to be rewritten. Interestingly, if you make data smart in the first place, so you semantically enrich data, then you can take mostly off-the-shelf software um, to maintain the smartness of the data so the data becomes more robust. So what we do in our work, and you can find a little bit more under this link here, is we semantically lift data um, and then we enrich the data, we categorize the data, we have so-called ontologies, so vocabularies about how, um, for instance, uh, transportation functions, how human trajectories or trajectories of cars function, how urban systems um, evolve and so forth and so forth. And once we have the data, the data can be deployed on any system and make quite a difference. So just the conclusions, the poi pulse that I have showed you has this nice feature of this default behavior model that models how human behave towards types of places, not only when they go there, this was just the example that I showed you, we also have what they say there. So we can distinguish by when somebody says, let me give you a very trivial example, uh, cheap beer, then this person is not at a police station, hopefully not, um, but for instance at a restaurant or something like that, right? If they say, you know, about if it's about changing tires and so forth, you see the story. And in combination you can, with the burst mode, you can detect, for instance, outliers, emerging events and so forth. The great thing, as I said before, about the the signatures is their minimal memory footprint. So of all this ginormous amount of data, we reduce it to a tiny footprint that is um, also quite mobile. You can bring it to other, to other cities, for instance. We have successfully applied this to uh, quite some tasks. You can find all the papers on, on the group's web page. Um, this analogy of semantic signatures coming from the domain of remote sensing is very powerful because it gives us a formal language and a formal mathematical framework from a very well established domain, namely senses and observations. So what we do, we can really talk in terms of observation quality, sensor resolution about what we call social sensors, not physical sensors in space, but the ways how we um, study data traces emitted by humans like the Wi-Fi signals, like check-ins, like um, tweets and so forth and so forth. And what we are hopefully going to do and um, when we find a little bit money for that is we want to publish all our signatures as an open library. Uh, creating spectral signatures has revolutionized the natural sciences like chemistry, remote sensing and so forth and we hope that publishing semantic signatures as an open library for everybody to use will hopefully make quite some impact um, on, on our domain of work. And that's it and thank you very much for your attention. So we're going to open the floor for questions now with a little Q&A. Uh, I think we're, we're going to have like 10 to 20 minutes to do so. Um, in the first place, I wanted to thank all, all of the speakers for the wonderful presentations. Scott, thank you for uh, giving us a little rundown of uh, the new capabilities of, uh, that, that ITERIS is developing. Uh, using probe data, and uh, Alexi for showing us uh, how we can approach uh, demand forecasting tasks using cell, uh, cell, phone, cell phone data, and finally, uh, Christoph for uh, showing us some new, new perspectives on uh, the exploration of different uh, data bands. So uh, we have a first question actually coming from our online community that is directly addressed to Alexi. Uh, so we'll, we'll start with that. Um, and, and this is Nathan uh, from my terrace, actually, who... <laughs> yeah, he's interested to know um, how could uh, the AT&T cellular-derived model be made even better by combining the data, uh, this data source, with static road sensors and mobile probe data. So, 
Certainly, this uh, cellular data got advantages because it gives you detailed uh, ODs and locations of activities. And uh, we try to use the loop detector only to, calibra to, to validate it. So we try to, to, to play it very, very fair way. You know, we, we really want to, to show that this model got something to do with reality. So we don't use currently any performance level, performance side data like loop detector or probing data to actually calibrate the model. We only use it for validation. However, it's probably in, in a particular project, you know, in a particular project, particular application, you could integrate it with, um, with, the, um, with the cellular data too. Um, I, I don't see why not. Mm -hmm. Thank you for a great presentation, and um, I'm glad we're at the beginning of the 21st century because we still have a lot to learn and see how we can apply all the data. And I think, um, for me at least, uh, you know, the uh, the PEMS data because we see it kind of tied in segments, and it, it looks similar to our system planning and in fact we do use PEMS data for our system planning that we do on our state highway routes is um, something that you know is, is pretty accessible to us to think about and, and I'm glad it's improving uh, all the time and um, the other um, data that is so fascinating to incorporate social media and um, and other type of activity into um, into the activity-based models and so on. Um, I wonder how in the future that will um, complement um, the type of survey data that we do, also how it will, um, how it will allow us maybe to start um, measuring in actual places how uh, vehicle miles traveled or the type of trips that are generated out of development and so on, which is something that we're trying to learn how to measure. And I would imagine over time that we might be developing those kind of um, abilities out of this data that you're putting different, different types of uh, sciences together. It's really fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. A question for, <coughs> question for Alexi and a question for Crystal. Um, Alexi, you mentioned 5G. As far as location accuracy, how is it different from 4G? How more exact? So it, it, it's hard to say now where the technology would go, right? Uh, but uh, more likely that the your phone will actually switch through the network to give you the better connectivity, the best connectivity possible, that it will jump from 5G to 4G to Wi-Fi if uh, your operator provides you this. And uh, what it means is that the spatial coverage will increase. There will be more smaller cellular stations on the streets integrated with another infrastructure that will cover the areas more densely. There's more precise. Location. It will be more precise in terms of location. Uh, I, I should also mention there is a technology to actually triangulate phones. And this technology is supported by 911 uh, type services. So every, every 911 call automatically being triangulated to the best accuracy possible. However, this technology is not used in standard operations and it cannot be used. Uh, so, you know, technology is out there, it's hard to say where it will go, but it will only increase the resolution and precision. And Christoph, you mentioned semantic uh, <coughs> signature libraries. When do you think it will be the uh, semantic uh, library? So, we have, we have thousands of those, of, sorry, hundreds of those bands, but we need to make sure that we understand their resolution, we need to make sure that we understand their spatial variability with regions, and then we need to make sure that we find a good model to publish in them. So we have, we have collected quite some data, we have quite some ideas how to do that, hopefully within the next year. And then the idea is to have this all publicly available because most, most people don't have the skills set, nor the time nor the money to collect you know, millions of traces of humans' behaviors over and over and over and over again. And there are so many domains also in social sciences that would benefit from them. So let me say 2016. Uh, 
And if that's not the case, then I'm not coming next year. <laughs> so we'll be keeping track of that and see if it becomes available. So now I'm going to take advantage that I'm more moderating the, the panel and I'm going to be asking a question myself. Uh, so we've seen here like that we can use different sources of data. These sources appear like continuously. We, we have also seen a variety of different methods uh, for analysis. So basically, we have a, a field that is constantly evolving. And then we have these uh, transportation agencies, uh, authorities that are that need to keep need to keep pace with all this all this expansion and, and, and new technology. So my, my question is: uh, Are you aware of like uh, which best practices are available for these sort of agencies to like stay on top of their game and like keep pace with what's coming out? And uh, if so, like just let us know a little bit about what what you think or of potential ways of doing so. So, and I, I'll I'll start with uh, with Scott first. Um, so, so I think some of the examples that everybody sort of walked through were the validation uh, exercises that you, that you go through when you're trying to deal with uh, a new type of data set and how to incorporate it into your existing practices. So, um, so as traffic probe data evolved over several years, there were lots of validation studies that got people more comfortable with it. Um, pulling it into your sort of uh, um, practices in a way that you're familiar with, and so doing the map matching, trying to get things to the referencing systems that you're, that you're used to. I think all of the discussions that were described here um, could, be, could be incorporated into those, and into the existing methods that, that, you, that you have, and so that, uh, I think the validation exercise of running through, you know, how does it compare to other sorts of data sets uh, like uh, was done in the cellular example, using uh, using uh, traffic volume data from 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 a known source, um, um, uh, as well as sort of the kind of the pattern pattern matching type uh, exercises. Um, in uh, uh, we're working with Virginia DOT, and they're exploring the Connected Citizens program that Waze has. And so they want to use their official crash records versus the Waze uh, incident data to compare sort of, you know, can, can they actually use that sort of social incident data to supplement or, or tell a different story than their official records tell and how does that change in certain sort of times. And so it's sort of using a, some kind of official source to, to sort of validate against the, um, uh, an emerging source to sort of get the benefits of both. Uh, ty types of, 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 of tools and as I think all of the types of technologies we, that we described today and the, the, the big data itself is, um, can, can be applied to agency practices in, in that way. And others have to more to add? <laughs> Any other ideas in this regard? So uh, I could add something to this. Uh, so private sector is really looking forward to share the data, they don't know how. Uh, and maybe it's uh, our role to actually define how it should be happening. Because for, for them it's a new market. Um, they, they'd like to sell it, they don't know how. The only thing that I maybe could add is that so many of the, so many of the wonderful data that becomes available is created by people either consciously or even just as byproducts of them moving through information space but this is a very important and very fragile social contract. So if people get the feeling that they are emitting data, so to speak, and we are grabbing everything we can to ruin their lives by selling more mobile ads to people who can't afford that, that's not the way to go and we will, we will destroy a wonderful ecosystem that is just uh, created. So I think keeping in mind what kind of information we need to be aggregated at which level um, is, I think, a very important thing. everything that they're doing. Now, a lot of people do sign a social contract. They do know that they're being monitored. But to the extent that people are informed of these tracking methods, um, how do we address the, the concerns that come about? Or can we? So I can only speak for my work. And, right. and what we do is, as I showed in my slide, we aggregate things to the level of types. I know that for some work, this may not be sufficient. But for instance, we could also show in, the, in another paper that we 
can reproduce the, the results from a land, I'm not a transportation scientist, I need to be careful with my wording here because I work with them, but you know. So we took origin destination um, trips from a, from a well-known survey for, for the area of Los Angeles and we could show that we can easily reproduce the data with a little bit of you know, manipulating and massaging tweets. And, and in this case, there's no need to violate the privacy of individuals because you only care about the zones, right? But I think what you said is, is very, very important and I think that we may be reaching the, the point in the development where people are not very happy with how data are being uh, treated, so we, I think we need to keep this in mind. Yes. Um, so it, it's good to see different kinds of data being used, you know, or having the potential to use for transportation planning. Uh, and just a thought came to mind, and I thought maybe I should ask you that whenever we swipe our Visa or Mastercard credit cards, is that data also connected? You know, so can you? You know, is there like a big data behind all those credit card transactions and geolocations and where you live, where you spend, and all that? Definitely, it's even bigger market with locational data, financial transactions. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're at the, the wrong place. You should be across the street trying to sell your product to the politicians. <laughs> Uh, so they can get dirt on their, their fellow politicians. Uh, but aside from that, um, uh, have you thought yet or put any, into any practice uh, these data being used in transportation models? Uh, that's a little different from planning. But it sounds like you're light, at least in the territory. So my, my colleague Costas Gudias from UCSB is, thinks that this is very promising for his work. I think that I'm here because some of you think it's very promising. I would be very excited. I think we have a lot of very interesting data. I'm only showing you here the pretty pictures. There's quite some interesting math behind that if you're interested in that. Um, so yes, just approach me if you see any fit of that and we are happy to share it all openly and publicly. If you ask for my initiative, I'm not a transportation scientist. I'm just going to embarrass myself. I'm going to you know, claim that I can do things that I don't even understand. Yeah, but I think Alexi did present on a few applications that are like directly related to transportation modeling, so he, he can probably like tell you a little more about that. Um, right, so this is very, very, very close to practice. So the Treasure Island project goes forward, uh, we work on that. The sea level rise project, that's, that's in our plans for the next five years. And uh, hopefully this, I mean, this research will will go into practice pretty fast. That's push from both sides, you know. Uh, yeah, how about what direction do you see it going in, yeah, into influencing the structure of transportation models? I think that the activity-based models will finally get to the precision level they've been designed for, you know. And uh, the scenarios that we you know, try to, 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 to build, like you know, changing conditions and, and simulating individuals' decisions, how they would aggregate into the transportation part. And I think this direction was, was really well thought through and we finally can calibrate them with the precision required so that models would correspond to reality in the accuracy that we need. I, I think at least I, I'm going to push this direction for the next five years. Great. So, yeah, so just to add up to this, so I think that the, all, all the results or all these modeling approaches that we're seeing here can contribute in the way in which like we, for example, or the agencies can allocate budgets, like they can make more informed decisions because they can then measure like potential impacts of their budget allocations and uh, hopefully improve the, the resulting transportation system. So I think that that's probably like the, the direction that we should go in. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question too. I, could, I, could I comment on that? Yeah, yeah. So the NSF project about the sea level rise, there are three levels there. Transportation is the background, but then there's a infrastructure for protecting the, the, uh, you know, the cost, coastal infrastructure, let's say. And then there's also a layer of decision makers and there are multiple agencies interconnected with sometimes uh, conflicting goals even. And their decisions would impact population 
far away from the zone where they're directly responsible for. There's all the all, all, all complicated networks out there. And uh, you know, the more precision you've got at the background level in transportation, the more predictable or the more you can quantify in supporting their decisions. One more quick one. That's not quick. The question's quick, the answer's not. Um, do you see any ways to define or uh, design sustainable communities to the use of this uh, detailed data? Uh, absolutely. And actually what I think is that this data uh, is also very valuable because for the first time you can quantify and, and find some metrics about communities and actually give people feedback about, you know, the same. If you think about sustainability as um, in, in, in some particular way, right? Let's say number of miles that you covered without using any engine. And you show how people behave around you, your neighbors. You somehow respond to that. So there are some behavioral modification approaches you can use. And this data will help us, you know, uncover these this possibilities, you know, manage demand towards sustainability, not, like, not be reactive to it. Uh, and uh, the, the detail of level helps. Okay. I'm having a hard time framing my question, but it's about assumptions. Um, I, I'd like um, any of you to speak to the issue of assumptions. Uh, um, I, I don't know to what extent assumptions play a role when you have big data because they're, you, you assemble uh, ginormous data, as you mentioned, um, or ginormous quantities. But I, I can't help but think about assumptions. For instance, uh, Christoph, in your work, I, I find it fascinating, but I wonder what or who might be left out. Uh, I have never used social media to tell anyone where I am. And so uh, uh, my trips aren't represented in that pool. Um, and so I wonder to what extent there is a self-selected pool of a certain demographic. And then uh, I, maybe in the case of AT&T data, maybe for some reason people who use some other carrier might somehow be different in a way that, that is not being captured. And, Maybe there's enough data that it all kind of washes out and, the, and uh, there, you come up with uh, uh, conclusions that are valid, but uh, can you speak to the issue of assumptions? Mm -hmm. So there are many issues that come to mind. The bias that you mentioned is just one, uncertainty is another one, the credibility or the trust that you put into the information. What we typically do to address this is that um, we believe that the, the key issue to understanding the data and big data in general is the heterogeneity of the data. So you're taking data about from different sources. To a certain degree, for our particular application, the issue doesn't arise to that degree because the population we are trying to simulate or to target is also the population that generates you know, the big picture of that data. But let me speak a little bit more specific to that. So, I would agree with what you said if this would be just Twitter data or Foursquare data or Facebook. I'm not on any of the social media things. But we also take Wikipedia articles, we take the news, but what you maybe even don't know is that in the moment where you're carrying a smartphone around, I know where you are anyway, right, without you having to do anything. And I would say by now most people carry those smartphones. So I think what you said is very important, especially for for certain parts of the population that may be further away from all the technology bus around us. Mm -hmm. um, but as a computing person, I'm so ignorant to say that this is our target population that emits signal, we are studying those signals. We know there's a lot left outside that we don't have access to. So on the bias correction, sure, I mean, we, we, we do a lot on this. Uh, we try to correct these biases. It, it's almost impossible sometimes because some people choose not to use technology and these numbers will go down and it will be a problem for quite a few years still it will be doing better i wanted to comment on the other part of your question uh, which was um, you know should we actually trust one provider or should we trust the multitude of providers and i think we should create an ecosystem where there will be always multiple providers of data 
location data that will be much more sustainable than relying on, on a single source. So connecting multiple telecom operators, connecting multiple social media sources, that will be much better. Well, it, it looks like the online community today is a little, a little shy, but we have another, another question in the live audience. Um, all of these things that you guys are talking about at the research level, someday you're hoping to become a pra practice in the field of transportation. That's what we're talking here specifically. And the kind of resources you need for that. Are people willing to dedicate resources to these that are cons consistently based on, on one court decision, they can all be thrown out. One Supreme Court decision will basically wipe all of your activities and say it's illegal. And so who's, who's funding these activities? Is Caltrans willing to fund it? Uh, are we walking on an eggshell? Are we putting resources where uh, we are basically, there's very little hope uh, and we are, we are basically looking at a doomsday where we're going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars and yet one decision, court decision comes down and boom, the whole thing has to go. So where, who's funding these? So I, I, I could start. Uh, so in terms of research, there's this interest from, from both sides. Um, my value proposition to telecoms, for example, is that without any overhead on their current operations, I can create a product that will run alongside their current, on their current system, alongside their current code, such that the outputs from this product could be of interest to transportation planners. There's no overhead for them, but there's no new opportunity for them. And also for, for us, you know, for them, there's no cost in producing this information. So it will be cheaper. It must be cheaper than sur manual surveying. So we will try to reduce costs on, on great opportunity for them, reduce costs for public sector. So it sounds like win-win. So I think you see some of it. I mean, there there have been you know firms like like uh, that have given their data. So taking the Ways Connected Citizens program, or the, um, the you know, I think Uber gave some of their data to Bo City of Boston, for example. The um, the there there are cases where the I think the private sector sees uh, some benefit in sort of sharing things with the public agency somewhat as a as a public good and and part to um, part to sort of help benefit regulatory <laughs> type type practices in some cases and then and others to uh, in Waze's case there it's an exchange of data for them so they are getting better data to feed their sort of their system while they're contributing data back to to the agency to help them sort of do their do their role and so there's a there's a um, I think from the public sector's perspective you know, you know there could be some future um, you know privacy uh, implications perhaps um, I'm not sure that 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 I, I guess personally think that's that's that would happen but the um, uh, I think the public sector gets the benefit of being able to experiment with all of these different sort of types of data in, in, in ways that 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 can sort of help take uh, take take modeling, for example, into into a, a more observed practice, um, perhaps um, while while you're while you're still using traditional methods to, to 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 manage the sort of the future of your network. So to maybe dive into the question, the the legal, the question of legal ramifications that you brought up. What if a decision of a court changes whether we are able to use personalized data? And I think the important realization here is that. You don't need that kind of data. You have to aggregate the data to meaningful units, and those units will be able to model your default behavior of whatever experiment you want to do or whatever you want to simulate. And then for specific regions, I think in cases of emergency, in cases of disaster or whatnot, it will always be possible to look at you know, incoming um, data. In terms of investments, uh, we need to know what type of applications uh, your research uh, have in terms of transportation specifically uh, to make those kind of decisions because we are interested in investing big data and we have been looking into it to supplement and complement our survey methods already and, uh, and actually we have a little study now right now uh, 
we would like to look into uh, to see exactly what is the application of some of your research in transportation, particularly in modeling and travel behavior, uh, to find out where our investment should be concentrated, because there are a lot of things going on. And you can't just simply invest unless you know specifically what's uh, immediately applicable and what's in the horizon. Uh, our interest is more immediate than, than the longer term, because we are a, a transportation agency. Uh, therefore, any of you are interested to look at our scope of work in terms of what some of these things means in terms of big data applications in transportation modeling and travel behavior, we have one for you to take a look at. Thank you. Okay. So, I think if there are no more or no more questions, I think we're we're gonna uh, call this this event as uh, finalized. Like we've been, we, I, I apologize that we've gone a little a little past the scheduled uh, end time of of the event, but uh, I would like uh, to finish just with uh, thanking uh, all three of our speakers with a little round of applause and <laughs> and, th and thank you all very much for having paid uh, so much attention and being here today. Thank you. <laughs>